If you've been with us the last several weeks, you know, actually all year, we've been in a series through Genesis and Exodus. We're now uh, approaching the middle of the book of Exodus, and we're excited about this series. It's going to continue on uh, for the next uh, several weeks, but we're taking a break from that series uh, this weekend to talk about uh, who we are, where we're headed as a church, culminating, of course, in the revealing of our new church name, which we think fits with where we're headed as a church. But I just want to let you know, if you're, if you're missing that, I would encourage you, all our sermons are online. Um, the next several weeks are very exciting. I always say this, but all of God's Word is exciting. But the next several weeks are really exciting. We're going to jump into the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, God giving his word to his people, and then focus on the significance of the power of God's glory, and then from there going to the meaning of God's presence, the tabernacle and temple. And I heard this week uh, a friend, was, we were talking, he says, you know, the greatest evidence of the resurrection, it was fun to sing resurrection songs even two days later, because by the way, He's still risen, in case you've forgotten. He has, wasn't risen just once a year. He's, he's risen and reigning, our king. But the, the significance, the, most, the best evidence for the resurrection is not historical, it's not archaeological, it's not literary, it's us. Because God's presence with his people was the tabernacle, then the temple, and then it was Christ in the flesh, right? The incarnation. And when he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, the spirit comes and dwells in his believers, and he calls us his body. You and I are the best evidence the world has of the power of the resurrection. Anyway, uh, that has a lot to do with who we are as a church. But I want to talk to you a little bit about names and naming for a minute. How many of you know why, I hope you know what your name is, but how many of you know why you got your name? The reason behind your name. Some of you, how many of you is a family name? You're named after someone, right? How many of you, it was, uh, it was a weird story. You asked your parents, you don't, and it was strange to hear that story. I had a friend uh, that I knew, uh, actually a girl I dated whose name was Jibs, J-I for Jim, her father, B-S for Babs, her mother, and her name was Jibs, which I thought was funny. <laughs> How many of you are named after Bible characters, biblical names? Anybody in here? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, I have three children, Noah, Hannah, and Benjamin. Those are good Bible names. And my sons, Noah, Joseph, my father's name is Joseph, and Benjamin, David, my father-in-law, his name is David, so we, we can figure out how he got those names. There are ground rules for choosing names for your kids before they're born, aren't there? Like, for example, and most of you probably have this ground rule, no names of former girlfriend or boyfriend allowed. Any of you have that, na- that rule, right? I would suggest a name when, we were, when Noah was um, not yet born, and my wife and I were thinking about the, what to name him and talking about names. We didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. I would suggest a name, and invariably she would say, oh, I knew somebody in school who I hated by that name. And so we just started crossing them off based on her tastes or her experience of those names. Choosing a baby's name is fun and it's challenging. It's a little bit random though, isn't it? I mean, to be honest, you're picking a name based on these preferences and these sort of ground rules and you're hoping it fits. And that's an interesting question if you think about it. Anybody ever tell you, you don't look like a Jeff or a, they probably didn't say that to you, right? You don't look, I, I, you know, it, does your name determine you or do you determine your name? Do you grow into it? Does it fit based on because it's given and you just, people know you that way? Uh, There's a word called aptronym. Anybody know what the word aptronym means? It means somebody who has a name that fits their occupation. So for example, if Pastor Coffee was to be a barista at Starbucks, that would be an aptronym. (laughs) Do you know the fastest man in the world is what his name is? Usain Bolt, it's an aptronym. Yeah, do you know who was one of the first to adapt, not invent, but adapt the, in, in, in the indoor flush toilet in London? Thomas, you can say it in church, crapper. <laughs> He's not joking. British meteorologist, Sarah Blizzard. I'm not making this up. So does your name determine you or do you determine your name? Names and naming is very significant in the Bible as well. Hebrew names almost always had a deep significance to them. For example, Isaac, who knows what Isaac means? Isaac means laughter, because he was the son of the promise. Abraham was given the promise of a son, and he and his wife Sarah were old and wrinkly and shriveled up when Isaac was born. And when God came and confirmed that promise, they both laughed. They named their son laughter. What What a beautiful inside joke they had with themselves and with God all his life. And Isaac had a son whose name was Two sons, actually, but one of the son I'm going to mention, Jacob, was the second of twins, and his name means literally grasper of the heel, heel grabber, because he came out second, hanging on to his brother Esau's heel. Esau, the red-faced, hairy one, I relate to Esau. The daddy's, you know, and Jacob, the smooth-skinned mama's boy, these two twins. 
Jacob, of course, has his name changed later. At times, God renames people according to his unique purpose, his design on their life, and his calling for them. We mentioned Jacob. In Genesis 32, we talked about this weeks and weeks ago. He has his name changed from Jacob to what? Israel. That's where the nation of Israel gets its name. The Israelites get their name from this one man who had this midnight wrestling match with God. The pre-incarnate manifestation of God comes and wrestles with Jacob. And his, Israel means struggles or contends with God. The people of God are those who wrestle with him to surrender. Because the great wrestling match for Jacob wasn't to conquer, it was to lay his life down, to hold on for the blessing. In the New Testament as well, Jesus renames some, uh, some people, one of his disciples, one of his followers, Simon, who he names Peter. That's the transliteration of the Greek word Petros, meaning rock. Peter didn't always behave that way, but it's because Jesus knew who he was and who he would become. Naming in the Bible is really not at all like choosing a name for a baby. It's not random. It's not picking and choosing. It's not looking up baby names in a book and deciding which one you like. It has to do with identity, deep-rooted identity that, that according to God's calling and purpose on your life. Very often that the person at the time isn't even aware of yet. When Jesus names Peter, Peter would go on to betray him and deny him. But it would be years until Peter would grow into the, the identity in that name. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, we're told this is going to happen for every one of us. All of us, eventually, are going to have that experience. We're going to be given a white stone with a new name, known only to the one who gives it and receives it. I love that image. I've thought about that over the years. What that means is someday you're going to stand before your, your maker and your Lord, and he's going to reveal to you who you've always been your true identity in Christ. This is who you are. This is who I made you to be. This is your name. Years ago, when I was a volunteer small group leader at a different church, I challenged the guys in my group to pray for somebody in their life who was the farthest from God they could imagine. So I want you to pray for somebody who's just as far from as you can, just somebody you think is impossible they could ever really trust in Jesus. And one young man named Chuck said, I'm praying for my buddy Judd. How are those for two good high school boys' names? Chuck and Judd. You know, I don't know where Judd came from. Judd, it was uh, six foot four, 220 pound. Everybody was afraid of him or, or loved him, and, and, and he was just too cool for school, and Chuck thought he'll never come. Well, we, I took him out under this willow tree by the pond, and we, I painted these stones white, and I said, I want you to write down the date with a marker, a sharpie, and their name, that we start praying for them. We put him under this tree. Two years later of consistent inviting, inviting, Judd never given Chuck the time of day. Judd comes, because Judd illegally slammed a kid on his head in a, in a high school wrestling tournament and was kicked out of the tournament and therefore was free the next evening to come to church. And he did. <laughs> he, he, he came to church to a, 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 an outreach event. Came late, so we had to sit in the front row. The guy given the message had an empty uh, wrapped gift as a symbol of God's free gift of grace in Jesus Christ. And as he was gi given, right down to the moment of receiving the gift of grace that God offers in Jesus, he tossed that gift. Guess who, whose lap it fell in? Judd. I'm in the back going, this has got to be God at work here. Judd's like, uh, you know, should I open this? Then he called for those who, who trusted in Christ to stand up, which is a scary thing to do for anybody, let alone high school kids. The first guy to his feet was six foot four Judd, tears streaming down his face. What a joy it was to walk Judd out the next day to that willow tree and say, two years ago, we started praying for you by name. God's known all along who you are and his plan for you and your identity. And that's, the truth is, for every one of us, everyone who trusts in Christ, there's an identity and a, a significance and a calling on your life that you don't always realize, but God knows. Not at all like the semi-random process of choosing a baby name. And in fact, our process of deciding on a new name for our church, I don't mean that God revealed it to us or wrote it in the sky, but I mean it's, for me and for our leadership, it's been much more like the process of discovery of who we are, who we've always been, and who God wants us to be, than it's been like kind of a random, just choose a name that we like. One of the fascinating things about names in Scripture is that they're given in the context of a story. 
the story of who God created them to be. And that's true about our church. Our church has a story and a history. So I want to give you a little context for our story as we move toward the moment. You're probably, some of you are like, just tell us the name already. No, not yet. <laughs> Make you stay. Right? Our church was founded in 1894 by a small group of Swedish immigrants. Some of you know this story. 1894. A group of families didn't want to make the horse and buggy ride from Geneva all the way to Batavia. So they decided to start their own church, known as the First Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva. Those Swedish immigrants came into the country seeking religious freedom. Particularly, they wanted the Bible, not the state, to be their authority. They wanted the freedom to preach the gospel without fear of reprisal. And you know, 122 plus years later, those two things, the Bible as our authority, and a desire to preach the gospel and to live that gospel out are still at the core of who we are as a church. I'm so grateful for that. They're still part of our core commitments, our DNA, if you will. In 1951, we changed our name. We've done this before. Did you know this? We changed our name from the First Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva to the First Baptist Church of Geneva, dropping Swedish out of the name. You know, Norwegians could come now and not feel out of place. About 15 years ago, we realized that the word Baptist had become something of a barrier to many people in our culture. And so we began using the abbreviation, FBCG. Which, how many of you have had people, if you refer to your church as FBCG, they've asked you, what does that stand for? Right? And you tell them and they go, oh, why don't you just call it that? We realized that the word Baptist, it has different connotations than for many of us what we have come to know and love. So you might be asking or wondering, why are we changing our name now? Why now? We have a unique opportunity with the launching of our third campus coming in the fall of 2017, just a few months from now. It's a unique opportunity. We have not been for a long time only a Geneva church, but now we're going to have a campus outside of this city. Our vision is to become a family of neighborhood churches in this region to reach, to, to multiply our impact by reproducing ourselves in neighborhood churches. We have a unique opportunity and responsibility to reach our neighbors and our neighborhoods with the gospel. Now, it's important for me to say, I've said this many times, you've probably heard me say it, but I want to say it again in case you weren't paying attention or in case you still don't believe it. We are not changing our name because we're ashamed of who we are. I love being Baptist in our, in our core doctrinal commitments. We are remaining part of our denomination, the Baptist General Conference which is now called, by the way, Converge Worldwide. Hmm. Right? We're not changing our name because we're losing our grip on the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, I am astonished that you, Galatians, have so quickly lost your grip on the gospel. We're not changing our name because we're going uh, away from the core tenets of the faith or the commi our commitment to the truth of his word and the power of the gospel. In fact, quite the opposite. It's because we're so committed to the power of the gospel Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? It's the power to salvation for all who believe. We're so committed to that that we don't want a name that's in the way of people experiencing that power that presents a barrier for it. And third, we're not changing our name because we want to be trendy, because we want to keep up with the latest trends, although it is certainly a trend among many churches like ours to change. We're changing our name for one reason, to be more effective, at reaching our neighbors for Christ. That's it. We think our name poses an unnecessary barrier to people coming and experiencing the grace and the love and the power of the gospel. Now I know and love what it means to be Baptist, and most of you do as well. A commitment to the truth of God's word, a passion to preach the gospel and serve our neighbors, a desire to make disciples. The world around us and our neighbors feel quite differently. Sadly, the word Baptist has become negative, even frightening to many people in our culture. A Tom Reiner article, uh, 10, top 10 responses to the word Baptist or associations. This is from last 2016. Number one, legalism. Number two, fundamentalism. Number three, potluck. That's not so bad. <laughs> Number four, traditional. Number five, boring. Number six, outdated. Number seven, southern. Number eight, protest. Do I need to go on? These are not great associations. Google search the, the phrase Baptist preacher says. Do you know that eight of the top ten th things you'll see are in reference to 
I hardly can even say it, to a Baptist preacher in California who was praising the awful shootings in Orlando last year. Eight of the top ten things that pop up, Baptist preacher says, not about the gospel, not about the grace of Jesus, not about the love of Christ. You know what they are? It's, it's about, I should have killed more of them. That's what our culture, and it turns my stomach. But that's what our culture thinks. That's increasingly what our culture thinks. I, I can see, whenever I'm at, uh, out, at, uh, you know, out at, in, in the culture at a fitness club, which is rare now, but occasionally, or, or you know, restaurants or whatever, and I'm talking to somebody, and they ask what I do, that's always a funny moment for me. I'm a pastor. Oh. One guy, when I was at the weight room one time, he, I said, I'm a pastor. He said, oh, not what I expected. You know, so. And I, he goes, well, where are you a pastor? And I say, uh, I, I, you know, or I say FBCG, huh? I say, First Baptist Church of Geneva. Some people actually physically take a step back. Whoa. I've had people do that. Whoa. Oh, no, 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 no. Not that kind of Baptist, because I know what's in their head. And then I need like two paragraphs. I'd sit down. Let me explain, right? The world around us and our neighbors feel very differently about these, these convictions. And that's not who we are. It's not who we are called to be. And all of you know that. There are currently, additionally, more than 200 different kinds of Baptist denominations and divisions in, our, in America. Did you know that? So many that it's, it's hard to keep track of them all. Let me give you a couple that are funny. The General Association of Regular Baptists. Sounds exciting. <laughs> Primitive Baptists. Huh? The Progressive Primitive Baptists. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> what does that mean? The National Association of Free Will Baptists. And the in, this is, this is, I'm not making this up, the Indian Bottom Association of Old Regular Baptists. Hey. Anyway, some of these groups are not marked by the love of God and love of neighbor. They're separatist movements. For too many people uh, mistakenly associate Baptists with angry, judgmental, protest, distant, not love and grace and truth. Clearly that's not who we are or who we're called to be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, the Apostle Paul gives a really a beautiful description, summary, if you will, of the mission of the church, of all of us, and particularly the church in the world. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I love this passage. God is in the wor- reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. That's God's mission. How is he going to accomplish that now that he's not physically present on earth? Through his body, the church, he's given to us the ministry and the message of reconciliation. God is making his appeal through you and through me and through us. Think about that for a minute. Just sit with that for a minute. God's appeal to his grace and his love and his mercy for the world is made primarily through your life, through my life, through our collective life. That's God's appeal. How are we doing? That's, that's the heart of the mission of what it means to be the neighborhood church. To be the appeal of God to the world. That he loves you. That he has great plans for you. Why lead with a name that means the exact opposite to many in our culture? We want a name that removes barriers to the work of the gospel. A name that's an open door to our neighbors and opens doors into our neighborhoods. We want an end that matches who we are and who we've always been and who we will be. Now, as we wrestle with these questions, we identified sort of three distinctive commitments that have always been present. There's more than this, of course, but three I want to share with you that have always been present in the life of our church, and they are now, and we are committed to them in the future. Three distinctives that make us who we are. These three commitments or values are all over Scripture, and we could spend a lot of time unpacking them from different verses, but I want to just take you to one place in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, because they're all really present in one story of an encounter that a woman had with Jesus, which illustrate these commitments. And again, they're all over Scripture. The first one 
is uncomfortable grace. Let me read John 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 30, but you'll, the screen will pick up at verse 7, I believe. Let me read John chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, that's John the Baptist, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of, in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. That means noon, by the way. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship what you, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is keeping such people, seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled at what he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do, uh, what do you seek, or why have you been talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him, and we'll stop there. It's an amazing encounter. We, we've preached on this, and you could spend a lot of time on it. The first thing I want you to see there that's true about us and true about who we want to be is uncomfortable grace. This means that uncomfortable grace means embracing people where they are, but not wanting them to stay the same. It means not putting up walls of judgment or barriers of condemnation, welcoming people, but then at the same time challenging them with the grace that calls them to a different life. One of the most striking things about this story is that Jesus even talked to this woman at all. He, why was he even in Sychar? You'll see here an image of a map on the screen which shows you uh, his route. They were, in, they were in Judea in the south near Jerusalem. They were traveling to Galilee in the north. That's where Jesus grew up. That's where Nazareth is. Any self-respecting Jew, certainly a Jewish man, of course a rabbi, would not go through Samaria. We won't get into all the reasons why, but suffice it to say, there's a lot of uh, backstory to this in the Old Testament. Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds and unclean and traitors to the true faith, and Jews would, would go at great lengths to go around that region, crossing over the Jordan River twice and going around that region to arrive in the north. They would not go through Samaria. It was unclean. Worse than Gentiles, even, they thought. So why does Jesus go there? In verse 1, he, says, he said to his disciples, we have to go. We must go through Samaria. No, you didn't have to go. Why did he go there? Think of it this way. Jesus had an appointment with this woman that he knew about and no one else did. It would have been very uncomfortable for his disciples. Why are we going here? Can you imagine when he said, go into town and buy food? He sits down at the well. He sends them into a Samaritan village. Talk about discomfort. We shouldn't even be here. What is going on here? And then they come back and they find their master talking with the Samaritan woman. Every barrier is being crossed here. Gender barrier, racial barrier, religious barrier, cultural barrier. 
Why are you talking to this woman, let alone a Samaritan woman? There's a lot more to say there. But uncomfortable grace means it's uncomfortable because you have to get close to people. People who are different from you. People who aren't like you. People who, outside of the grace of Jesus Christ, you would ordinarily be tempted to ignore or shun or despise. I talked to a man years ago who, who got into our Friday morning team ministry. He's a blue-collar guy. He's rough around the edges, doesn't have a college degree, barely got out of high school. And he sits at a table with about seven other men. And they're all white-collar business professionals. Highly educated, successful, owning or high executives in their businesses. And my blue-collar friend said to me, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't even like those guys. <laughs> now I love them. I love them. He, he, was, he was amazed at himself, saying, if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus Christ, I would hate those guys, let alone sit with them at a table. But now I love them dearly. Uncomfortable grace. It's, grace is uncomfortable to receive, isn't it? Because the gospel, before it's good news, is bad news, that you're a sinner in need of salvation, that your life isn't okay, that you're not right before God, that you need to be forgiven and made right in his eyes through Christ. That you're not, it, it, the, grace is not just the message, God just loves you indiscriminately, it doesn't matter. It's you have a problem. And the only solution is the forgiveness offered in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So grace is uncomfortable to receive. It's also uncomfortable to extend because you've got to get close to people who are also broken and hurting and in need. I want, we are called to be a church, as Christians in general, but I want us to be a community that's committed to uncomfortable grace, both receiving and extending it. We're not afraid of people who are different, who think different. The second commitment is the commitment of that faith drives growth. Faith drives our growth. Now when we say this, it's important to say that not the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith that drives growth. It's not just that you believe something strongly, it's what you believe in. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the power of his gospel, faith in the truth of his word. The book of Hebrews tells us that faith is the assurance of things we hope for and the rock solid confidence, like an anchor for our soul it calls us, it calls it, for those things we can't see. So assurance of what we hope for and a deep rooted confidence in what we do not see. Prior to last year, you know, I, I, I hoped the Cubs would win the World Series, but I didn't really have faith in it. Now I have a confidence that it could happen, right? Because it could happen. For those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, faith means I am rock solid, unshakably confident in stuff I can't see. God is real. That he exists. That he made me in all this, this world, and he made me in his image. That he has a purpose for my life. That because of Jesus, he's redeemed my life and forgiven my sin. That he, his, the spirit has come into my life, and he gives me the power to live as he's called me to live. That he's coming back to restore all things and judge the world, and I will reign with him. All these things, because his word tells me, and the spirit testifies in my heart, I, I have faith in them. I can't see them. I can't prove them. But that's faith. Faith drives growth. Meaning, it's not the latest church trends. Our, our history as a church, really, bears this out. Our growth has not been related to church growth strategies or, or marketing gimmicks or church trends. It's been the deep-seated conviction and faith of people over centuries, over a over hundred years. Belief in these things, and we're here as a result of it. In the story of the woman at the well, in John 4, we see this progressive progression in the woman's faith. First, you'll see here, verses 13 through 15, Jesus makes this remarkable statement to her that she doesn't really understand at the moment. He said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst again. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, give me this water that I'll not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She's thinking about what? Water. It's hot. It's noon. I don't want to have to keep coming here drawing water. If you've got some sort of magic water that keeps producing itself, I'd like to be in on that. That'd be a good thing. Jesus says something much different than this. He's saying, I'm, I'm promising you something that will change your life far greater than having to come to the well every day. In verse 19, she says, I see that you're a prophet. Why? Because he talked to her about her past. This is why he brings up that stuff, right? In verse 25, she says, I know the Messiah's coming. And then, we didn't read this, but in verse, so she's, in, she's in process of her faith growing in this encounter. First, she's confused. I don't understand this water. Then she says, I, I can tell you're a prophet because you know stuff about me. 
that nobody knows except those in my town. And then she's like, no, Messiah's coming. And Jesus says, that's me. She still doesn't get it. But at the end of the encounter, she understands. And we know what happens. She goes back in verse 30 and tells the town. And in verse 39, we didn't read this, but let me read to you verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. Faith drives growth. That's why Jesus had to, didn't make the circuitous route around. I'm going there to talk to this woman, and because the transformation in her life will be so drastic, that everyone in that town will know. Because of her testimony, many will believe. Many Samaritans believed. I've seen this borne out again so many times in our church over the years. I've seen the same principle at work. Some of you saw the video of Scott McLeod a few weeks ago when he said it was serving that made me a disciple of Jesus Christ. I used to be afraid to pray out loud. Now I pray with people all the time. Who, he said to his wife, who is this guy? And faith drives growth. Third, finally, our commitment that is central is to who we are is to impact beyond. Here's what I mean by this. This means going beyond the immediate need. Going beyond to make an impact greater than just what's in front of you. This is so clearly what Jesus is doing in the story, isn't it? He's so obviously doing this. Why does he bring up her husband's in the past? It sounds like a non sequitur. She says, you know, give me this water. He goes, uh, call your husband. Sounds like he's changing the subject. Why is he doing that? He has a greater agenda than she could Eve ever fathom. He wants so much more for her than she could possibly imagine in this moment. And he's driving at it. So he's going beyond water, physical water, physical thirst, to the deeper need. And this is, the, this is what's going to transform her life. She's there for H2O. <laughs> He's there for much more. This is the reason that this is happening. There are so many examples of this in our, in, our, in our church over the years. I want to tell you just a couple of them. This will be affirming. Some of you know about this. Others, you may not have any idea. In a church our size and as diverse as we are, I think it's, many of us don't know the wonderful things that are happening on a regular basis around here. One of our ministries is called Masterpiece Ministries. That's an umbrella term over uh, several different unique ministries. This Masterpiece Ministries is, ministry, is, is reaching children and, and families of children with special needs. It started because a couple of moms, one of whom had some training in this area, had a passion and said, we're not doing enough. Not just us, but the church in general is not doing enough to reach these families who really have very significant needs. And so we started off by just having some people go through some training, and then we set aside a room. But it, it grew from there. It grew from there to where we, we, when we added our West Campus edition, and we're doing it again, where we built rooms specifically designed for these children with these needs. And it grew from there to not only caring for these children, but to impact beyond those kids to those moms and dads with a respite ministry called Buddy Break, which now we do on a, it's not quite monthly, but it's, how, how frequent is it? I forget. We just had one Saturday, I believe, Buddy Break, uh, where dozens and dozens of kids are dropped off to be with a buddy all day so mom and dad can have a break because they're exhausted. Going beyond. And not only that, but there's Masterpiece Moms, a uh, support group and resource group uh, communicating the love of God and his grace for their unique situation and raising these kids, these wonderful children that are precious in God's sight with these unique needs. Impacting beyond, right? Seeing a need, not just say, okay, we have to do something, but going beyond that. Why? For the purpose of uncomfortable grace. To reach people with the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, let me, another one, our Shepherd's Heart Ministry. When I first started working here, we had a food pantry. You know what a food pantry wa or, it was? It was a closet down the hall that had some canned goods, where if you came here and you were hungry, somebody would walk down the hall, unlock the closet, fill up a bag with canned goods, walk down the hall, give you a bag, and you went on your way. That was our food pantry. Now, if you go right downstairs here, we, our food pantry, when our last renovation project, serves over 1,000 people a month, 1,000 individuals a month. Just this past week, we had a, a haircut party because somebody who's not even a believer who occasionally cuts my hair does a fantastic job, if you notice this. She said, do you, does your church ever do things for, for people that are, that are hurting or in need? I like to do haircuts like for, for people that, that can't afford them. So she and some of her friends who aren't even part of this church came here and set up an, a party where they were cutting hair for kids and families who are clients in our food pantry, and it was a fantastic. Talk about impacting beyond. Not only that, our, food, our Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry now has people that are budgeting counselors, teams of people who meet with those who are in need, not just to hand them some food or some cash, but to help them get their life on track, to give them life skills in handling their, their finances and resources and money. And so many other things, job, career counseling, finance, uh, pastoral counseling, so many other things that are happening. Why? Not, not, be, 
not to pat ourselves on the back, but to say God's given us these resources and this opportunity. He's placed us in this part of the world for a reason, to make the greatest impact we possibly can for the sake of the kingdom. It's not, okay. it's not enough just to have good services once a week and walk out of here feeling mildly inspired. Impact beyond. Uncomfortable grace, faith in Christ and the truth of his word driving our growth, and the des- desire to impact beyond. That's why we want to be a family of neighborhood churches. That's why we're doing this. Launching the third campus. Again, not because it's trendy or cool, because we believe God's put us here for a reason. Those who have come before us have had these commitments, and we are, it's our turn to embody these, to pass them on to those who come after us. Recently, I came across a great question. I was reading a blog post about the church, and he said the typical question is where do you, for Christians is where do you go to church? And we think about the building, right? Where do you go? He says, what if we started asking not where do you go to church, but where does your church go? I love that question. Where does your church go? What does your church do? What is your church engaged in? What are you people that call yourselves the body of Christ doing to make an impact in the world? That's far more exciting than where do you go and sit one hour a week. Paul David Tripp, a theologian, pastoral counselor, writes, he has a, called The Theology of Uncomfortable Grace. He says, God wants to take you where you don't want to go to produce in you what you could get no other way. Isn't that great? God wants to take you as his son or daughter to places, like figuratively and literally, that you don't want to go. Why? To transform you. To produce in you something you can get no other way. Uncomfortable grace. Faith drives growth and impacting beyond. God is indeed taking us somewhere. And the simple truth is we want our name, our name to align with that. We want it to fit, not be a barrier to that. A name that doesn't scare people away or require a paragraph of explanation, yet still maintains our commitment to uncomfortable grace. Faith driving growth and impacting beyond. I could just tell you right now, but we did put together this really uh, great video that will reveal the name to you. But I hope you have a sense for where this is coming from. And so we'll watch this and then we'll wrap up. Our church, it has quite a history. It's a pretty amazing thing to stop and think about all that God has done here. Yes, buildings have changed, worship styles have changed, even our leadership has changed over the years. We've seen families raise their kids here, and then their kids continue to make this their church and raise their families here as well. We've watched our community evolve around us, and we've grown with them. And even though we've come a long way from when we started over 120 years ago in a tiny building downtown with just a handful of people and our name, First Swedish Baptist Church of Geneva, even amidst all these changes, there are constants that have remained as our foundation. And those constants are why we remain committed to being a church that is reaching our neighborhoods a church that is impacting lives, and a church that is seeing people experience God's grace in their life and watching it truly transform them. It's our commitment to uncomfortable grace. That means we're a place that embraces people right where they are, but challenges them never to accept staying the same. A place that sets a new expectation in our lives and helps us see what God sees for our lives. Uncomfortable grace means pushing past our discomfort to engage our neighbors, And it's our conviction to let faith drive growth. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the power of his gospel, and faith in the truth of his word. This means that seeking God has been and will always be our strategy. This promise means we're going to do what this church has always done. And we're going to follow wherever God leads and do whatever he asks us to do to impact the world with his gospel. And then it's our desire to impact beyond because we know the church is bigger than a worship experience. And we are intentionally looking for practical opportunities to impact our neighbors, our city, and the world beyond our walls. This means that each one of us must see ourselves as gospel agents on our streets and in our neighborhoods. Because we don't believe the church should wait for people to find us. Rather, the church should find people and begin helping them experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where they are. Because the church is much more than a building on Kesslinger Road or Mill Creek Drive or South Street. It's each one of us, each one of our homes as places of grace, faith, and impact. Every house like a chapel on its street. In fact, the very word chapel actually means small house of worship that's connected to a larger church body. I love that image of every house as a chapel on its street. 
And as we began looking at what the right name would be for us to move forward in our future as a church, we wanted it to be rooted in these promises, to be a church that brings the gospel to every house, puts a chapel on every street, and brings the church to every neighborhood in our city. And we wanted the name to capture that this is a place where everyone would have an opportunity to experience grace for where they are, to grow in their faith where they are, and to make an impact right where they are. And I believe we have that name, a name that says who we are as a church, who we've always been, and it captures the reason that we exist. And I'm so excited to announce to you our new name. FBCG is now Chapel Street Church. Hey. I can't tell you the level of excitement and anxiety I've had for weeks leading up to this. Now, now listen, some of you are as excited as I am. You're like, finally, it's here. I love it. Others of you are going, huh, not what I expected. And you're processing it. That's okay, right? Some of you, I, I'll bet there are some of you here are still going, I don't even know why we're doing this. You're still wrestling with that. I want you to know that's okay. In the universe of words, right, the combinations of words to make up a church name is not really the point. I want you to make sure to get this right. The point is what God is leading us to become and, and putting our name that doesn't create an unnecessary barrier for that, to be the kind of place that represents Christ well, that's committed to the gospel and makes the greatest impact we can. Uh, I really uh, am excited about that. It's a little weird to watch yourself reveal the name, but never mind about that. As you leave here in a couple of minutes, you'll, there'll be a table you'll, you'll see with a white tablecloth as you go. If this is your church home and you're part of the church family, there's going to be a black bag given to you uh, that has some, some, some stuff in it with the, with the Chapel Street on it. Again, I want to encourage you and urge you, don't tweet it, don't text it, don't email it, don't post it, don't uh, run around your neighborhood with the windows down shouting it, you know. Just wait until afternoon tomorrow, and we'll all celebrate together because we want those who at both campuses and all of our services tomorrow to have the same experience that you have had. Um, we're, we're excited. We're moving forward because tomorrow we'll be rolling out banners over all the signs on the street. The website domain will be a, a link. It'll actually let, take you there. All of it changes. There's a lot of work to do and people working behind the scenes. But starting tomorrow, we are Chapel Street Church that every one of us sees our lives and our homes as a, as a place of worship and impact, like a chapel on our street. That's the idea. You know, for a long time, I wanted neighborhood in the name. But, but I realized neighborhood is the vision. It's not the name. The name, and I, personally, the name for me, I like it because it's not the one word trendy name. Some of the names that were suggested were uh, hokey. <laughs> so this one feels connected to our roots and points us in, in the direction of our future. So again, thanks for your patience. I hope you're as excited or you grow to be as excited as I am and as our leadership is about where God is taking us as a church. I'm going to pray and then dismiss you and you can pick up your Chapel Street swag. Father God, thank you for your grace poured out in our lives through Jesus Christ. We're not worthy of it. We don't deserve it. But you freely give it. And that grace is, while it might be free to us, it's not free to you. And it certainly isn't comfortable or easy but it's so good. Help us to live uh, according to that commitment to uncomfortable grace. Thank you for the faith you've given us to trust you in all things. Let that drive our growth, individually and corporately. And God, give us your heart to make an impact beyond just the immediate needs, to go past the immediate, to reach people where they are, in their hearts. Thank you that your church is to be a place where everyone can grow in their faith, experience grace, and make an impact right where we are. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.